Well, welcome to St. Peter's Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Xavier, and whether you know Jesus or not, or whether you're just here investigating things or interested, warm welcome to you. In a moment, you will hear the Bible read and then explain. We firmly believe here at St. Peter's that God speaks to us today through his life-giving word. And my prayer is this will help you to know him or to know him better. Enjoy following along. Good morning. My name's Paul. Um, I'm reading from Matthew chapter 15, verses 21, through to the end of the chapter. Um, it starts off with two parts. So Matthew 15, chapter 20, uh, verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, is it not right to take the church? It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Jesus feeds the four thousands. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speak, the crippled made well, the lame walk, the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have had nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where would we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowds to sit down on the ground. There he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples. And they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were 4,000 besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went across to the vicinity of Magadan. Here in the reading. I hope you got your Bibles there, or you share a Bible with a person beside you. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 15. We're finishing up in our reading of uh, this biography of Jesus' life for this term, and then we're going into the work of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, once school goes back, so I'm looking forward to that. So we're in chapter 15, and I want to start off by asking you a question uh, in the experience of your life. Have you, have you ever experienced being excluded or denigrated uh, because of your ethnicity or your skin colour or your cultural background? Have you ever experienced that? Now, I suspect that some here among us have, but I wouldn't be surprised that a lot of us haven't. And are you aware that Tamworth is one of the least culturally diverse uh, places in Australia? Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me that you haven't experienced this. But if you have experienced it, you will know how demeaning, uh, how dehumanising and unjust it all feels. Um, a few years ago, we had a South Korean uh, ministry trainee called Young Hoon. I don't know, it was three or four years ago. It was before COVID. I don't know if you guys can remember him. A lovely young man. And uh, to prepare him, when he came here to do ministry among us and get trained, to prepare him, I did a whole lot of different things. But I also said to him, I said, brother, 
Unfortunately, because we'd had experience of this previous, unfortunately, you may face some racism in this town. Anyway, I said, I hope this never happens to you in church life. So after about six months, I sort of, I thought I'd review how things are going with him. I said, how things are going? And he said, yeah, I'm enjoying it. And uh, let me know, how are things going in regards to racism? Have you experienced that? And he said, yes, I have. And I said, oh, oh, I'm really sorry about that. How often? And he said, most days. Most days. I thought, that's terrible. You know, just riding his bike, somebody to shout something out from a car or something like that. I said, that's terrible. I hope you've never experienced that in church life. And he said, never. So here I was, you know, with mixed feelings. I was, I was ashamed of being an Aussie when he said that, yet I was proud to be a brother in Christ when he said, no, amongst the church family, I haven't experienced it. Now, I don't know if you were shocked to hear that kind of story. Um, we ought to be shocked, wouldn't we, that we treat people like that just because of uh, certain differences. And I think in our culture today in Australia, and I think this is being built up certainly through social media, that some of the top tier sins in our culture would be to be uninclusive, you know, we've got to be inclusive, and to be racist. These are top tier sins. Yet, as I just explained to you, we still unfortunately experience these kind of things in Aussie culture. So we're, I think as... Western culture in Australia, we're quite sensitive. In fact, we're hypersensitive to these kind of things, inclusion and racism. And I would bring it up because the interaction between Jesus and a foreign woman just seems to be so uninclusive and even racist. Uh, Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. In other words, I was sent only to my Jewish nation. And that sounds really uninclusive, doesn't it? That sounds very nationalistic. And for us as followers of Jesus, if we're not Jews, we're going, hang on, didn't God send Jesus for me? So we've got that problem in the text. But he also said to a foreign Canaanite woman who was asking for help, he says, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And um, that seems like, doesn't it? that he is implying that she's a dog, <laughs> that she comes from a people group that are dogs. Um, and so we struggle here. It sounds like, very much like a racial slur. Now, can I just reassure you here at St. Peter's, <laughs> and for us as Christians, we definitely don't think that Jesus is kind of exclusive and nationalistic, and we don't think he's racist in the slightest. Um, but this episode is tricky for us. And I don't want us to do gymnastics to try to explain away hard things. Um, my prayer, and I'm praying, that we'll come to a deeper sense of what is going on here, that we might respond, that you and I might respond the way that Matthew, the author of this gospel, this biography, and God as well, how he would like us to respond. And I think the way that he wants us to respond is with faith, but a certain type of faith, with humble, bold faith. Now, I don't know if you're a follower of Jesus yet, whether you have faith in him, whether you, that is whether you trust him or not. Uh, I'm really glad that you're here checking things out. If you, you're not yet, it's fantastic to have you among us. Maybe you are. Maybe you say you are a follower of Jesus, which is fantastic as well. Um, would you classify your faith as humble, yet bold. Uh, we're going to think about that question this morning from this passage. All right, so you up for it as we tackle this? Good on you. Well, uh, to tackle this, I want to show you, first of all, I don't do this all the time, but I want to show you the structure of these passages because I think that's going to help us to see what the author Matthew is doing, what God is doing actually behind it, what's going on. So here we go. Let me give you the structure of the passages and then we're going to get into it in a bit more detail. In the immediate context beforehand, we have seen Jesus showing extraordinary willingness and compassion to a whole group of people, 5,000 men plus women and children, that's 15 to 20,000 people, as he fed them. 
Uh, and they were all Jews, I think, right? The, this ethnic group, Jews. Then after that, we have an interaction uh, with Jesus and an individual, this time Peter, and he's described as having little faith. Uh, when he walked on the water and then he sank, but Jesus said, why do you, you have little faith? So there's an interaction with an individual. And then you have a kind of a reflection on the human heart. Uh, Jesus does some teaching on the human heart. And then after that, you have an interaction with an individual of great faith this time. That's the Canaanite woman. And we're going to look at that particular passage this morning. And then after that, you've got the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus showing extraordinary compassion and willingness to another big crowd. And this time, I think the crowd is Gentile. In other words, not Jew. In the Bible worldview, if you're new to church, you've got Jews and then everyone else are Gentiles, okay? So when you hear Gentiles, the rest of the world. That, can you see there's kind of a sandwich structure here? So just take note of that. That's going to be important as we try to unpack what's going on. Well, um, let's get into it. We'll come back to that structure. The first question is, is Jesus being uninclusive here in his interaction with this foreign Canaanite woman? It seems to be like that. So have a look at your Bibles. We're just going to pick up the context. Verse 21, um, Jesus leaving that place, that is Jewish territory, uh, he withdraws to a region up the north called Tyre and Sidon. And this region is foreign. This is foreign territory. This is non-Jewish territory, okay? And a Canaanite woman, a foreign non-Jewish woman who actually came from a historic people group that were enemies of God's people. Uh, this Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out. She's kind of desperate, saying, Lord, son of David, which is like king of Israel, right? Have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. And so we have this desperate woman in great need appealing to Jesus for help. Now, there are two surprising things here. The first surprising thing is that she seems to understand who Jesus is, this foreigner. Did you notice that? She calls out, son of David, which means the king of the Jews. Whereas Jesus' compatriots, fellow Jews, didn't seem to get who he was and weren't responding to him appropriate. So we've got this foreigner who's starting to get who Jesus is. That's surprising. The second surprising thing is Jesus' reaction. Um, if you were here in church a couple of weeks ago when I was teaching on the feeding of the 5,000, you, you might remember that I said that we see here the heart of our Lord who has just great compassion towards anyone in need. He's just always willing to help those in need, even those people who don't get him yet. Um, but here, it seems different. He rebuffs this woman three times. He seems reluctant to help her. And it just seems so out of character. Um, have a look at verse 24. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. In other words, I was sent only to the Jews. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if, if you're a believer in Jesus and you're not a Jew or from a Jewish background, anybody from a Jewish background here? We praise the Lord if you are. That's fantastic. Okay. Who's from a Gentile background? Oh, I'm up you go. <laughs> the whole lot of you. <laughs> we all. <laughs> you're going, hang on. <laughs> We're here because of Jesus. Didn't God send Jesus for me kind of thing? Andy, uh, good on your brother for doing the kids' talk. It's tough doing kids' talk. <laughs> Andy, our staff member here who did the kids' talk, he pointed out the language here, and I think this is helpful, and I'll point it out to you as well. You see, there is a difference in between saying, here we go, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, and there's a difference between saying, I was sent only for the lost sheep of Israel. Now, Jesus didn't say the second statement, right? You can be sent to a place but not just for that place, but also for other places, but you're sent to a particular place. So as believers in Jesus here, many of us will know that Jesus was sent to Israel, but he was sent to Israel for the whole world. In other words, there is a, 
temporal priority. There's a timeline thing going on here. For Jew first, then Gentile, the non-Jews. And this gospel, this biography, Matthew's gospel, which has a very, very Jewish feel to it, if you start reading it right from the beginning, it starts with a genealogy, with a sort of the history of uh, Israel, has a whole world in view. In the very first sentence, it traces genea- uh, Jesus' genealogy to the son of David, to the son of Abraham. And if you know the story of the Bible and Abraham, you will know that God made a promise to Abraham for a particular nation, but it actually would be for all the nations. So that Jewish gospel, but flagged right up front, is for the whole world. You come right to the end of the gospel. If you know the end of the gospel, you've got Jesus resurrected from the dead and he's going to, he's telling his disciples what to do. And what does he tell them to do? I am going to go to all the nations, the whole world. So very Jewish gospel has the whole world in view. So God has sent Jesus for everyone. But there's a temporal priority. Jesus had to come to the Jews first to be then a blessing to others after that. Uh, Let me give you an illustration just to bed this in a little bit. Um, Imagine a local fire brigade. Um, A local fire brigade in a fire-prone area. What will we pick? The Blue Mountains, okay? Mount Victoria. Now, that brigade exists for the community. They don't exist for themselves. But imagine that this local fire brigade, let's make it up of 12 men, why not? Imagine they're completely dysfunctional, okay? There's infighting in regards to who is in charge and nobody's taking orders from anyone. Um, and as a result, they don't do their training properly and some of them just come to, the, to, to work and play video games and the equipment isn't well maintained and some turn up to work when they want to and others don't and there's disorder and dysfunction. The fire season is a couple of months away. Uh, The town could be in danger, don't you reckon? Yep. Head office knows that this brigade is dysfunctional. So what do they do? They send you. They send you what, to go and fight the fires? No. (laughs) They send you what to this brigade? This bunch of 12 men, why? To sort them out. Sort them out so that that might be a blessing to others. And so Jesus came to his own people and he gathered 12 blokes together and he sorted them out in regards to God's kingdom that they would become like a new, reconstituted, restored Israel, if you like. And from then... Through them, he would send them out with the message of who he is for the whole world. I think that's a little bit of what, what, like what we see happening here. So Jesus isn't uninclusive, not at all. There's just a temporal priority, a timeline thing going on here in God's plan. Jew first, then Gentile. So you guys okay with that? That's good. All right, that's a little obstacle that we overcome. That's not the harder obstacle to overcome. But what about the racial slur? When this foreign woman in great need comes to Jesus for help, he seems reluctant reluctant to do anything and he says to the woman, we've already read it haven't we, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, We get the temporal priority thing, that's not too hard, but hang on, that, that just seems one step too far, doesn't it? That seems harsh. Is Jesus implying that she's a dog? Now, no matter what gymnastics you take to soften this, it just sounds wrong. Um, Some people have said that Jesus was just joking. He's being jocular, all right? to draw out this woman's great faith, which was there. Um, It's a pretty inappropriate joke, don't you think? Uh, Others point out that the word for dog here in the original language could be applied not to a street dog, but to a household pet, to maybe even a puppy cared by the family. But that still seems demeaning, doesn't it? To call a foreigner a household pet? 
No matter how you cut it or try to soften it, it definitely sounds like a racial slur. Other people say, and I don't hold this view, and most Christians won't hold this view, this woman, in her quick, witty response, because she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs gather up the crumbs under the table. She's very witty and quick. They say that this woman actually breaks Jesus out of his racist Jewish nationalistic culture, where Jews supposedly called Gentiles dogs. They say she broke him out of that, and he starts to, from this point on, he starts to become inclusive and interested in the nations. So basically they're saying that Jesus had to change. He had to repent. Now, I don't know if you're a follower of Jesus here yet or not, um, but can I just tell you, if you're not, for those who are followers of Jesus, Jesus' moral perfection is just so, so important to us. It's essential for us. Um, if he had to repent, if he had to change of a because of a racial sin. Do you know what that means for us as believers? It means we can't be saved. He had to be perfect to take our sins upon himself so that we could be washed clean. So we can't go down that track. So what do we do with this tricky um, interaction? I'm going to make this reading even harder for you. <laughs> you thought it was hard enough? I'm going to make it harder, in one sense. I'm going to make it harder for you and I to accept. But as we make it harder for you and I to accept, it will take away the racial slur thing and it will bring us deeper into the heart of what's going on in these passages, in this section of Matthew's Gospel. And it will get you and I to think about where we're at and what's really behind these interactions. So here we go. When we hear the word dog, we tend to read in our own cultural bias, racial slur. But words in different times can mean different things. You know, back in the 1930s, um, if I were to say, he is gay, what would have people have heard? He's happy. He's a joyful person, right? If I say he is gay today, well, it means something very different, doesn't it? When we read dog, we hear racial slur. But what if this isn't a racial slur, but something else? Um, this week I was listening to a New Testament scholar, uh, Dr. Peter Orr. Uh, he was giving a sem seminar and he was speaking on different passages. This one came up. And he was saying there is absolutely... No evidence in the time of Jesus of Jews calling non-Jews dogs. I'm not surprised by that. Really. In all the literature of the time, zilch. No recording of this happening. And I was surprised. And so I got his number and I contacted him and I said, Peter, could you tell me the evidence for what you that bold statement? And he sent me a very detailed research technical paper. There you go, by email. So if you want to see a very re research technical paper, come and see me afterwards and I'll give it to you. <laughs> now, you and I, without being experts in first century Judaism, you could start to question whether this is a racial slur simply by reading your Bible, reading the Old Testament, and reading the New Testament. Because there is evidence there that dog can mean something different. So let me show you. Let's go to the Old Testament. This is Jesus' thought world, right? And we'll go to Psalm 22. And I'll put it up on the screen for you. As King David says, For dogs have surrounded me, a gang of evildoers has closed in on me. So here we can simply see that David, King David, associates dogs not as a racial category but as what? A moral category. Evildoers. In the New Testament, we have, a, have similar evidence. Paul, writing um, 
before Matthew's gospel, actually, Paul warns Christians in Philippi saying, here he goes, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. And when he talks about mutilators of the flesh, he's talking about those who are enforcing circumcision. So we see Paul equating dogs here, like David did, with evildoers. Now, these dogs could have been Jews enforcing circumcision, or they could have been also Gentile Christians enforcing circumcision. But the point is, from Psalm 22 and Philippians 3, dogs is not being used as a racial slur or racial category, but as a moral category. It's speaking of those who are morally defiled, morally corrupt in regards to God. And I much prefer this reading. Remember I showed you the structure of the passages? Remember this? Jews, then an individual of faith, then something in the middle, and then another individual of faith, a Canaanite woman, then the Gentiles. Can you remember what's in the middle? The defiled human heart. Smack bang in the middle of this reflection on all people, Jews and Gentiles, Jesus teaches about the human heart. Um, let's listen to his teaching on this. I'll put it up on the screen. Jesus said, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with ritually unwashed hands doesn't defile anyone. So there's a sense in which all people, whether Jew or Gentile, this is out of the heart of any person, we all are defiled, all have a moral problem at heart. That's why this reading is harder for us. Because this is Jesus' view on you and I. This is Jesus' view on the human condition. So if Jesus is referring to dogs as a moral defilement, that changes the way we understand this, doesn't it? There's a sense in which Jew or Gentile, we are all unworthy. And this Canaanite woman seems to acknowledge that. She goes, yes, Lord. I am. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs under the master's table. She's humble. And so she, she seems to understand who Jesus is, the king of the Jews, the son of David. She seems to understand what's going on in her own heart, that she is morally defiled. But she seems to also understand that this king of David, this Jewish king, didn't come just for them, but he actually came for her as well, morally defiled like she is. You know, uh, just, I think it was last week, I had a challenging interaction with a brother in Christ here at St. Peter's after a service. And towards the end of our interaction, he said to me, say, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. And I think what he meant when he said that to me is, I'm a sinner, Xavier, I'm unworthy. And I was very quick at that point to point to him to the fact that, but you know what, brother? You're also a dearly loved child of God. That Jesus did everything necessary for you to be forgiven. He's poured his Holy Spirit into your life and you're no longer defiled before God. You are clean. You're a dearly loved child of God. So here I had a brother in the faith, who is expressing his unworthiness. And friends, that's where faith begins. It germinates when we acknowledge, well, where God's Holy Spirit helps us to acknowledge that you, and myself included, we are morally defiled on the inside. We can hide it from others, but we can't hide it from God. And we can be cleansed. But we don't just stop there looking at our own hearts and going, woe is me, etc. What do we do? Well, what does the Holy Spirit do? He boldly takes us to Christ, the King of the Jews, who is 
our King, who came to wash us clean by his blood on the cross and give us his Holy Spirit that we might be willing to live for God. That's true faith. Humble, but bold. And I think this is what Matthew is doing in his gospel when he hold, upholds this Canaanite woman, says she is of great faith. And I think it's actually a critique against Matthew's own people group, the Jews, who didn't get who Jesus was, didn't see their need and didn't turn to him. But she's being upheld as one of great faith. And if he's upholding her as one of great faith, then I think he's saying to his readers and he's saying to you and I, what type of faith do you have? Is it one like this? Is it one which is humble and you go, yes, Lord, I know that I'm defiled on the inside. But is it one where through the Holy Spirit you, are t you come boldly to the King, the Son of David, the King of the Jews who actually came for you so that you may, might be washed clean as well? So... What's the character of your faith? This is, I think, true faith. Humble, but bold, because God sent Jesus for all people. And friends, I think at the end of the day, what Jesus does here, because he talks about our human condition, is very humanizing. It's not dehumanizing. It's humanizing, where we can be honest with God, honest with each other. It's humanizing. Now, I don't know whether in our culture today to talk about what's in the inside. Is it true that some, in some aspects of our culture today people say, oh, we're all good on the inside? We just sometimes stuff up and make mistakes? The Christian gospel doesn't say that. It tells us where we're at. It's honest. But I think it's actually humanising. I was thinking about, um, you know, our cross-cultural trainee, Young Hun, when he came among us. And I was ashamed of what people in the town, how they treated him but proud of my brothers and sisters in Christ and how he, we treated him. And I was thinking, why, do, why did we treat him like this? And I think part of the thing was we got to know him, right? That breaks down prejudice. Just getting to know somebody who's a little bit different, that breaks down. But I don't think it was just that. I think it's also because he came, he knew he was a sinner. Forgiven. And we know we are sinners and forgiven. And that is profoundly humanising. And so although our world will tell us, no, we're good on the inside, it's not humanising at the end of the day. It's not real. So may the Lord help us to treat each other with that humility and come to the Lord with boldness. Because I think once you get that, you understand the human condition, it tends to remove racism. Or well, it's a little seed that helps us to remove racism and go, you know what, we're all in the same boat. And isn't it marvellous? that God sent the Son of David for you and I, Gentiles, as well. Praise the Lord. How about I pray? We'll wrap up. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your great, great kindness to us, to all people, that although we are defiled internally um, through trust in your Son, the Son of David, the King of the Jews, who is actually King over all, we can be washed clean and receive your Holy Spirit and new hearts. Pray, Father, for any here among us today who haven't turned to Christ, that in your great kindness you might, Lord, help them to see where they stand with you, but that you would point to them to the solution in Jesus. And we pray, Father, that this truth of who you are and who we are might help us to relate to each other in humanizing ways, in loving ways. For your glory. Amen. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, here at St Peter's, we consider ourselves to be God's dearly loved children. We're passionate for him, and we desire for everyone to know Jesus and to grow in him. And we have so many activities around that for toddlers, children, youth, uh, young adults, adults and more. Feel free to drop in any time at one of our gatherings at 8 a.m. as kind of more traditional service. 10 a.m. or 4 p.m. we have children's programs or 6 p.m. in the evening that's followed by dinner. You'd be more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, we'd love to help you. We do a series called Hope 
and you can meet new people. Or if you'd like to join St Peter's, uh, we have a special series called Belong, which can help you find your feet. So let us know. You can text us on 0466 200 791. I'll repeat that for our radio listeners, 0466 200 791. Or you can use the QR code, which we'll leave up for the next minute or so. Enjoy your week.